so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a very big uh, round of applause to Robert Halford. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm very proud to be here today, not just because I followed Christopher, but because I first joined the Freedom Association after I, I, in, when I was in Exeter. I was at Exeter University, and I went to the Imperial Hotel, and Christopher Gill, Norris McWhirter, and uh, Philip van der Elst, who many of you will remember, were doing speeches. And I joined the Freedom Association on that day uh, and have been involved with it ever since, and particularly involved since uh, Simon Richards has been uh, taking the helm. Now, I'm very proud to be here today for another reason, because in, I've always felt there are three important places that have helped mankind. And I'm proud to have been to every one of them. The first is the foot of Mount Sinai, where the Jews were given the Ten Commandments, which governed the behavior of mankind to one another. The second is here at Runnymede, where for the first time in our history and in the history of mankind, the king was told that he was not above the rule of law and that he could not do as he pleased. And the third most important monument is in Washington DC, the Abraham Lincoln Memorial, the man who stopped slavery and said that no man could subjugate another man against his will. But it is this one we're here today for, Runnymede. Yeah, as I said, it is one of the most important documents in the history of mankind. It is a document that wasn't done 20 years ago, not done 30 years ago, but on June the 15th, 1215. June the 15th, 1215. Now when you consider what the document contained, and given the views and the philosophy at the time, it was all the more let us remember that Magna Carta came about because King John had been excommunicated by the Pope. And whilst I may not agree with King John, it was at least the first sign of some Euroscepticism. <laughs> and then it came about because he wanted to conduct foreign wars and he wanted to raise extra taxes. And the barons had had enough. And I'm proud that one of the barons actually comes from my constituency in Harlow and built a tower in a place called Shearing, which is just outside Harlow, built the marshal of the barons who organized the Magna Carta. And what was incredible about the Magna Carta, you've got all the clauses in it, I'm sure some of you have seen them, but the most incredible thing about it all was that for the first time in the history of mankind, it said that if the king does wrong, we are able to seize his lands and his property. If the king does wrong, the people can seize the lands and property over the king. It gave people rights. It said that the king was not above the rule of law. Now, surprise, surprise, the charter, whilst being signed, of course, there was some backpedalling. And actually, it was defined and redefined over many, many years. It went from 61 clauses to 42 and then 47. And only actually in 1217 did the Magna Carta get its proper name. It's changed again over the centuries. And in 1217 there was an even more important document than the Magna Carta published. And it was called the, the Charter of Forests. Now why was the Charter of Forests more important than even the Magna Carta itself? Well, in those times, forests did not just mean the odd wood here and there, but it meant fields and meadows, and it meant land. And it gave the people, the Charter of Forests for the first time, gave people the rights over their own land and said the king can't just come in and do what he likes. So the Charter of Forests, which was the, the next step from the Magna Carta, was the first document that gave the common man their rights. And amazingly, the Charter of Forests stayed law in this country until 1971. It was superseded by what was called the Wild Creatures and Forest Law of that year. So the Charter of Forests that grew from the Magna Carta 
stayed our law, was central to our way of life for many hundreds of years and was only updated in 1971. Now, um, the Charter, as I said, people with the Charter evolved over time and some of the clauses were taken out, some of them kept in, some of it was weakened. But by 1237, the King confirmed, the then King confirmed the original precedents of the Magna Carta, the original principles, and it was called the Carta Parva. And in 1297, the Magna Carta was again strengthened, more people became involved. And by uh, 1331, Edward III had become a, made it a core part of our statute, a part of our English law. And he made a fundamental change. He said that it applies to everyone, not just free men. If you remember, there were serfs at that time, and other people were free men, and the king at that time extended the Magna Carta to everyone. Now, over the centuries, the Magna Carta was reaffirmed 45 times. 45 times it was reaffirmed. And although the year I was born, by 1969, most clauses had gone from the Magna Carta, three very important ones remain. The freedom of church, the church, the ancient liberties of the city of London, which Alex Dean, I no doubt, will be pleased about, but the Clause 29, which is in essence what defines our common law. And that is still in place today, even with the, uh, even with the encroachment of the uh, European Union. And that clause said that citizens have rights that are not arbitrary or capricious, that we have rights that we are as equal as anyone else. Now, what are the lessons of the Magna Carta for all of us here today? First of all, often the rights of man and constitutional change become, become for democratic elections. Freedom and liberty are not just about having elections. They are about the rule of law, religious tolerance, equality towards women, property rights. And the democratic elections are just one part of that. We often forget when we look at elections in the world, we say that country is a free country. We said that Hamas was free because they had elections. <laughs> and we have to make sure that we know the difference. That often it takes time to develop democracy. It takes a lot of time. And democracy, as I say, is not just about the mechanics of elections, but embedding a rule of law, embedding property rights, embedding rights towards women, embedding religious tolerance, so that and those things take many, many years. And when we see what is happening in the Middle East, it's no, not right to say these people do not deserve democracy or they're not ready for it yet. They will take time, as we have taken time, as the Magna Carta took many centuries to develop. And we have to support them in that way. The third lesson, of course, is that you have to constantly fight for liberty. As a parliamentarian, as a new parliamentarian, I have often seen that there are many rules on, uh, and regulations, and you wonder why there are so many rules and regulations that one sees that are unnecessary. But when you think about it a little bit further, you realise that those rules and regulations are the padding around the core. The core is our values that we believe in. And every time you get rid of a little bit of padding here and there, you slowly get down to the core and then only you have uh, the, the core left. And if we look at Hitler's Germany, Hitler was able to do what he did, not because he just came in and imposed a dictatorship, but because for the last 20, 30 years since the First World War, the Germans had weakened the padding around the core. They had weakened demo demo democracy and demo democratic values and liberty. So it was very easy for Hitler to begin to do what he did. The final lesson of the Magna Carta is not just we have to keep the padding around the core of our values, but we have to fight for it all the time. My favourite quotation is, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And, and it is not something that every day, in one form or another, our liberties are under attack. 
and we have to fight very hard and never be complacent. And that's why coming here today, reminding ourselves what we're all about, what has made this country great, is not just a lovely day out in the summer, but incredibly important. And if I had the funds, I would make every school child in this country come to this very place where we are standing today. And that is why we need organisations like the Freedom Association. Because the Freedom Association stands for freedom. It is why I joined it in the first place all those many years ago. We have to have organisations that are out there, that are proud, that are not afraid to stand up against the consensus and fight for freedom wherever uh, we can and protect what we have in order that we can guarantee future generations the freedoms that we have enjoyed. Thank you.